Fire Emblem Three Houses is 21st Century Gesamtkunstwerk. Now, if you didn't go to music school, or perhaps if you're just not a native German speaker, you probably heard that and thought, bless you, did you just sneeze? And to that, I say no. But I did use a very fancy German music word. So what is this Gesamtkunstwerk, and how does it relate to Fire Emblem Three Houses? Well, let's break it down. It literally translates to total artwork, but in the most general sense it refers to the synthesis of multiple art forms to create a single, greater work. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but that's the main idea. Usually you hear this term discussing things like opera, in particular opera written by a guy named Wagner. Yes, Richard Wagner, classical music's greatest neckbeard and the guy who wrote... Kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. In fact, the term Gesamtkunstwerk is practically synonymous with Wagner's operatic work. It's most known for the music, of course, but Wagner often wrote his own texts as well, and had a direct hand with most, if not each, aspect of the production, and thought of his music as merely one of many tools to help convey drama. You see, prior to Wagner, Western classical opera was often much more of a hodgepodge of art forms. One person would write the music, one person would write the libretto, one person would design costumes, so on and so forth. Not that there wasn't multi-artist collaboration with Wagner or those that went after him, but each aspect of the opera before his time often seemed detached from one another, like it was just some fun music, with some fun acting, with some fun set design. There was drama, sure, but not much that would be truly irrevocably changed if one piece were altered, added, or removed. All this to say, Wagner is one of the first to coordinate each part of the production of opera in such a way that the whole would not be complete without any individual piece. But Wagner? Opera? That's so 19th century. Let's move ahead 150 years or so. A more modern example of Gesamtkunstwerk you're probably already familiar with is film. Think about it. Film is never just film. It's usually a synthesis, a cinematography, acting and casting, scoring, costume and set design, dialogue, so on and so forth. I mean, could you imagine Star Wars without the John Williams score, or The Dark Knight without Heath Ledger as the Joker? I think not. And as I'm describing all of this, some of the dots might be starting to connect in your head about how all of this relates to Fire Emblem Three Houses. And yes, I'm finally talking about Three Houses more than two and a half minutes into this video. There's the gameplay mechanics, the character design, the voice acting, the soundtrack, and so much more, and I feel it's critical to understand that each of these little bits of the game are important enough to make the game incomplete if anything were missing. Think of it this way. Would Fire Emblem Three Houses really be Fire Emblem Three Houses without the soundtrack? Would Three Houses really be Three Houses without the gorgeous artwork between each chapter and the voice of Gerald narrating? Would Three Houses really be Three Houses without the support conversations and monastery activities? Would Three Houses really be Three Houses without the lore and how each character fits in? I could keep going, but I think you get the idea. In fact, let's focus in on the voice acting and music for just a bit. I'll start by telling you a bit about my experience with the Fire Emblem games I played prior to Three Houses. I've been playing Fire Emblem since 2011 or so when a friend of mine had me buy the Shadow Dragon remake for the DS, and from that time until Three Houses I had played all the mainline 3DS games plus Blazing Sword. I, of course, enjoyed all these games, but two things always bothered me in my experiences. First was the constant flipping of music during combat. This wasn't a problem in all the games, but it was especially bad in Shadow Dragon, where I'd be enjoying the music while moving my units during the player phase, only for the music to abruptly swap when entering combat, and then start over once that was done. Take a look at this example here. Alright, so Harden... Okay, as long as Harden lands, there goes the Armor Slayer. This obviously doesn't ruin the game for me or anything, I still enjoy it, but it always was kind of annoying to my ears to abruptly switch every single time. And yes, I know you could turn off the battle animations, and perhaps I should have just done that, but for some reason, I never did. Thankfully, this wasn't nearly as big of an issue in Awakening and Fates, where they would have two versions of the same track seamlessly blending into one another during different actions of the player phase, though sometimes it was the same track continuously. Here's an example from Fates. Okay. 
For some reason, it was still an issue in Shadows of Valentia. This was always so weird to me because Shadows of Valentia fixed the other problem I had with the other 3DS titles, the mere partial voice acting. During the dialogue sections in Awakening and Fates, characters would have short phrases spoken over their actual written dialogue, as opposed to full voice acting, which also proved to be distracting to me, especially when the spoken and written lines didn't match. Here's an example from Awakening. Um. Simply put, right. Indeed. I can understand why they did it this way, but still, it took away from my experience just a bit. In fact, both of these issues eventually got to the point where for a long time, I wouldn't even bother listening to much of the game while playing. I would often just have music playing from my iPod or laptop or whatever else. It wasn't until recently that I finally began allowing myself to listen to the actual soundscape of the games again, allowing myself to jam to the likes of Don't Speak Her Name, Id Purpose, and End of All, which is now one of my favorite endgame themes in the entire Fire Emblem franchise. Now, compare the ever-changing music and partial voice acting of prior games to Three Houses where everything is both fully voice acted and the music during each chapter blends between movement and combat. When we first met, you used to call me by my name. That was because I was unfamiliar with Fodlin's speech. Thinking back, such rude manners were inexcusable. Truly, it makes the experience that much more satisfying and immersive. It all but made the game for me. But back to the main topic at hand. Earlier, I mentioned film as a modern example of Gesamtkunstwerk, and it is perhaps the most well-established one we have currently, but there are two reasons why I want to highlight Three Houses instead. First, film is a genre that spans more than just the 21st century in terms of artistic achievement, critical acclaim, mass appeal, and so on, whereas video games, even though they've existed since the 20th century, never really gained renown and respect as an art form on a broad scale until the early 2000s or so. But the second reason is the main reason why I'm highlighting Three Houses. This game, and most video games in general, have a very specific feature that good old Dick Wagner over here and even the likes of Alfred Hitchcock or Orson Welles could only have dreamed of. And what would that be? The direct interaction of the observer. And now you're probably thinking, oh great, more fancy pants terminology from the fancy pants fine arts guy. You probably made that up, didn't you? Well, kinda. It's actually a fairly well-known phenomenon, but I'm not sure it has a specific name. Essentially, it identifies a dichotomy between two major parties in the engagement with and consumption of art, the creator and the observer. The creator creates the art, i.e. a composer, a painter, a writer, and so on, and the observer consumes the art in the form of purchasing or viewing or whatever else. You go to the movies, you're the observer. You listen to your favorite tunes on Spotify, you're the observer. You attend a concert, you're the observer. But typically, the role of the observer is relegated to a passive one. When you go to a museum, you usually only get to look at the art. When you attend a concert, you only get to watch and listen, unless you're at a show of some form of popular music. But even then, most interactions with the performers still have a follow the leader sort of dynamic. You're still observing and responding to what's happening on stage. In a way, Three Houses is like this too, what with the limited number of storylines, limited dialogue choices, and so on. But the player observer still has a notable amount of agency. You still have the ability to choose any of four campaigns, you can recruit characters from outside your house which can affect certain aspects of the story, you have an incredible amount of customization for classing each of your characters, and the list goes on. 
Also, depending on which route you choose to take first, you're only exposed to certain aspects of the lore and world building, meaning the choices that you make directly affect the way that you experience the overall story of Three Houses. Of course, I can understand how this may turn some people off, but in this case I quite like it. Once again, I'll use my own experience as an example. I won't go too in-depth on it, but I'll discuss some of the broad strokes of my first playthroughs for each route. Quick warning, I will be addressing some brief spoilers. I played the routes in the following order, Azure Moon, Crimson Flower, Verdant Wind, and Silver Snow. Playing Azure Moon first, I only caught a few glimpses of the lore as the story mostly operates as a character study of Dimitri, focusing on his dual struggle against Edelgard and his traumatic past. Because of this, I couldn't yet fully grasp who those who slither in the dark were, or what their aims consisted of. I also wasn't sure why Claw just decided to up and leave Fodlin in the middle of the campaign, and there were a lot of other questions I had from White Clouds that remained unanswered. I'm obviously not trying to say that these things are bad, but rather that the story really felt small in scale, and clued me into the fact that I had a lot to pay attention to in the other routes. Next was Crimson Flower, and while it did fill in some of the blanks from my Azure Moon run, it still felt small in scale, focusing in on Edelgard's personal struggle within the backdrop of the larger conflict against Dimitri, Rhea, and the Church. And despite the greater role of those who slither in the dark, I still couldn't quite piece together the significance of them, nor did I grasp the significance of Edelgard turning to take them out after defeating Rhea just yet. And speaking of Rhea, where Azure Moon, to me, portrayed her as a victim of Edelgard's belligerence, Crimson Flower portrayed Rhea as a vile aggressor, which was an interesting perspective to see juxtaposed. I'll talk more about that in just a bit. But first, we move on to my Verdant Wind Run, where my understanding of the overall story of Three Houses really started to expand. Finally, I had developed a greater understanding of the role of those who slither in the dark, and I learned that the conflict between Dimitri and Edelgard was really just one stage within a much larger conflict. Furthermore, Rhea is portrayed as secretive and distrustful as she tries her hardest to keep the true nature of herself, of Byleth, of those who slither in the dark, etc. under wraps until Claude and company finally manage to tease the truth out of her. My fourth run, Silver Snow, was very similar to my Verdant Wind run, which shouldn't be much of a surprise to anyone that's played both, as the stories are nearly identical until their respective endgames. The big difference here is the predominantly tragic portrayal of Rhea, one of the final remaining members of her kind who is ultimately consumed by her bestial form and mercifully put to death by Byleth, Sedeth, and company in order to keep the world from falling victim to her madness. Now keep in mind, I'm highlighting Rhea in each of these for a very specific purpose. Since I first understood Rhea as a victim, as portrayed in Azure Moon, I experienced my other playthroughs through that lens, seeing her as an imperfect yet fundamentally virtuous and caring leader who was dealt a poor hand and who ultimately faced a tragic end. Someone who played Crimson Flower first, however, may have played the other three routes with the impression of Rhea being a stubborn villain, trying to keep Fodlin firmly within the grasp of herself and her institution, and who had to be eliminated in order for the world to pursue progress. But Rhea is just one example. You can also apply this thought process to Edelgard, who I will be addressing in detail in part 2, stay tuned, as well as many other characters and other aspects of the game. For example, someone who played Verdant Wind or Silver Snow first would likely have a greater sense of the lore, which would inform the way they pick up on smaller details of Azure Moon and Crimson Flower, as opposed to someone like me who had to wait until a few playthroughs in to find answers to the mysteries set up in white clouds, especially as it relates to those who slither in the dark and the story behind Sothis and the Nabataeans. But do you see what I mean now? Each story may not be perfect, I might discuss that another time, but the way we subconsciously frame the stories in our mind is a direct result of the route we choose to take first. No movie or opera could dream of adding this type of observer interaction to the totality of its artistry. And observer interaction doesn't stop there either, and heck, it's not even restrained to the game itself. As time goes on, I find my experience of Three Houses, and the Fire Emblem franchise in general, to be incomplete without seeing the responses of other players, particularly on the internet. Think of all the fan art, comic dubs, video essays, online forum discussions, and everything else that has spawned from this game. Not only do players engage with the game itself, but entire communities are built around it, and our experiences are informed not only by our own playthroughs, but also by the experiences of those we interact with. Heck, even the memes have proven to add endless joy to my experience of the game. Alright, 
I hope you liked that brief digression because I'm going to have to stop this video for now and continue in another one coming sometime soon. Long story short, this is my first time doing any substantial video and audio editing, and I'm still figuring things out as I go, so I don't quite feel comfortable making extremely long videos yet. But hopefully, you at least have a decent grasp on the big scary German word by now, and hopefully the thoughts I've put forth today are more than just a jumbled mess. But in any case, I'll be expanding on this topic more in part two, where we'll be talking about music. See you then.